Noel means to, to be born. I don't know if sometimes we sing uh, songs, Christmas songs, Christmas carols. Maybe they haven't been passed down as well as they could have been or should be. But Noel simply means to be born, to be born to us, to be given and it's special. Or earlier we were singing in Excelsius Deo. What does that mean? glory to God in the highest is what it means it's important that we understand what we sing and that our praise makes the connection of our hearts Father we love you this morning and we say thank you, we give you glory our highest praise excelsius Deo our highest praise, the highest glory. And we just say thank you for being born to us today. Thank you for being born. We honor you. We look to you. Expect to hear from you. Illuminate to us your word today. As we, as we sit, not just before it, but come under it. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, <clears throat> you know, there's all kinds of Christmas songs, isn't there? Um, you know, Christmas can, uh, sometimes all of what we celebrate as Christmas, um, as the coming, really the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, it can get lost in uh, reindeer and Santa Claus and elves and uh, traditions and Rudolph or Grandma got ran over by, um, never mind. Uh, Christmas songs and just fun, uh, and you know there's good and there's fun stuff, but let's just make sure that as we as we are entering and as we enter this this time of December um, that we don't lose the, the the main reason, which is Christ. And um, and so I'm not saying you can't ha laugh and have fun and all that kind of stuff, but I do think what we're going to look at over the next few weeks, we're going to kick off a new series, and that is uh, the title of the series is uh, The Arrival of the King. The Arrival of the King. This is what we're celebrating, the arrival of a king. And we're going to be talking about that, and I, I think it just maybe change a little bit of our, uh, of our heart or our approach, not just to Christmas, but just to today, to each day. And, um, and so this morning... Um, uh, if you have your uh, Bibles, we're going to open, if I can get my computer open, um, we're going to open our, our Bibles to Luke, where we're going to actually start this morning, <clears throat> Luke chapter 2, 10 and 11. So, um, and I want to just, uh, I want to, wanna, before you put that up on the screen, I want to maybe do a little setup this morning uh, for, for this series and what we're, what we're going to be talking about over the next three weeks. Um, if you heard somebody said the king is coming, the king, the king is going to be here, the king is coming, you might ask a question, like when? Like when is he going to be here? How many of you know, like where is he going to come? Like which gate is he coming to? Is he going to come into, like the king is coming, king is coming where? The king is coming when? Uh, what king? The king, the king, okay. Uh, okay, well wh why, why is he coming? You might ask some questions. When, you, when the king is coming, you, why is he coming? Why is he coming? Am I in trouble? Could, had you ever thought that? Have you ever heard the statement that, oh, oh daddy's coming, mama's coming? Like you're like, uh-oh. You know when your brother and sister and maybe they're, or, or maybe you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Maybe you're up on top of the cabinet, you know, getting into the, the, the stash up, you know, mama's stash or something like that where, and then, so, you know, you got to look out your brother or sister, they're looking out and then they go, mama's coming, mama's coming. You're jumping off the cabinet. What does that mean? What does it mean when somebody's coming? It means it can, co it can come with so many different meanings and so many different like loaded things. Um, it could come with the understanding that there, when you have a new king, uh, and not only that, that, but when this was spoken, when the, the, there would be a king coming, and even the, the Jewish people thought this, they thought, we're going to have a king, but it's not just any king, it's a king that comes from my family. So that means something for me. How many of you know, like, uh, America got real, real bad in this, actually, and, and Brand said, I, and I, I hope this doesn't uh, offend too many people, I'm saying it anyway, um, this is what I do. Uh, 
I was in Branson, and uh, there was a store. It said, uh, Trump is my president and Jesus is my king, or something like that, on the same sign. Or maybe, or Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president. Like, like we put them like this, on the same sign. And, and that's really where America got to the place where, like, like we had this hope because if I said Trump is going to be president, people would be like, oh, God, I think it's, it's uh, oh, heaven. We're getting the next four years of heaven. And can I tell you that Trump has never been the savior of the world? But if we, I would have said to, to, you know, a few years back, and even for some yet, and say Trump's going to be president, it, it, there would be, I think that would be greater news uh, than even Jesus is returning. He's my savior, but Trump's my president. Trump will take care of here and now, and Jesus will take care of my future. No, we don't want that. But these are on the signs. These are on the, the places. The, 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 it's just, but there's this idea of what I, if I was going to say that, this idea that, tr- like, the king is coming. You, there would be all this. Here's what we would think if we were to say this, that Trump's going to be president. We're going to think he's going to repeal this law, and he's going to do this law, and he's going to do this law, and he's going to do this. We would think when a king or a president, all we know is president, we don't understand king, is there's going to be a new way. So this is what, when, when a king comes to town, or not just a town, but when a king is placed on his throne, his word is now the word. Maybe, and, and it means more when you've been under a tyrant. When you've been under a, a place of great uh, uh, adversity. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, when the, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. And so there, there's something about that when you hear the king, when we, when we know it's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, one who has good in store for us, we, we anticipate more than just, you know, where, when, why, I wonder what, what, what is his reign going to be like? What is his decree? What is the, now the law that we're going to come under? We're going to talk about the, this over the next few weeks about the arrival of the king. This morning we're going to talk about hope. We're going to talk about hope. And so I want you to see this in Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. But the angel said unto them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news, good news of great joy that will be for all people. How many of you know that good news, uh, good news really does bring great joy? He's bringing you good news, but this good news is not just news that's temporary. This is news that will be great joy, or you could say it this way, great strength for all people. It, it'll be a lifting of heads. Uh, it'll be a, a hope in the hearts. It'll be, it'll be like, and I don't know if you understand this, but most of you will, when you're in fourth or fifth grade and you don't want to get up to go to school except for that Friday when you got the field trip. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You don't want to go to school every day, but Friday you're going to the roller skating rink. And so, guess what? The, the, it's like, bing, the shoes are already on. I mean, you're ready, and you're just ready to get to school. Why? Because there's something, there's a great joy, there's, a, there's an anticipation of what is tomorrow holds. And because there's an anticipation of what tomorrow holds, there's strength. When no other time do you have strength. I got a son, my youngest son, Caleb. Um, he is, he likes to sleep. Ever since he was little, he would give us, we call this thing, this one-eyed Caleb. I don't know where he's at. Is Caleb in here this morning? He'd give us the, the one-eyed Caleb. So when you wake, when he was born, it's like he didn't want to wake up. He just barely cracked one eye. Like kind of just, oh, okay, I'm going go back to sleep. And he'd, he'd, he'd eat, you know, like mom, mom would be feeding him. And he'd be like, yeah, okay. Just, just enough. And so this has kind of been his story as he's grown up. He's like, you, you, he's give you the one eye. Okay, like, ah, I'm not going to get up. But when it comes to hunting, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. And it's time to get up. It's time to get up. There's something about the hope of what that big buck could bring. And every, not just my son, but every guy here understands there's nothing more tired than deer hunting tired. After day three, you are so tired, but somehow you still find yourself getting up. You pray for snow or rain or some kind of excuse to keep you sleeping in, you know, something. But, because, but the hope or the anticipation of maybe that, that deer getting that big one today, it gets you up. It gets you up. Or the sunrise, it might be. Just that quiet time, right? And so he says this, but the angel said unto him, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you Good news of great joy that will be for all people. For today 
in the city of David, a Savior has been born, who is Christ the Lord. We know, according to uh, Nehemiah, that, uh, that the joy of the Lord is a strength. Joy, it's a fruit of the Spirit, who is our helper. Joy, he, well, he, he came with a message that was to bring joy. Can I tell you that the message that was given that day was not the message that the Jewish people were looking for? They were looking for a king and said, God sent a baby. We're talking about hope this morning. Really, we're, talking, we're going to be talking about misplaced hope. Misplaced hope, like I thought it would be this way, but it's not. I thought it would happen this way. I thought, and, and here's what happens so often, a misplaced hope. We place our hope in the Lord, but it's really not even in the Lord. It's in some outcome. It's in some breakthrough. It's in some something. And it's not even, it's not in the Lord. And it's misplaced hope. Misplaced. And we hope it would be this way. And we'd hope it would be this way. And we give God praise that he's good when there's good breakthrough. And when it's not, we just stay silent. Can I tell you that... Um, Trials that you're going through, they're temporary, but so is breakthrough. Breakthrough is temporary. You're behind, you need some money, pay your bills. Guess what? That money's going to come in, and you're going to pay your bills, and you're going to have that, that, yeah, all right, woo, pressure's off. But guess what? Next month's coming. Just here to let you know, this is an encouraging word this morning. Trials are temporary, but so is breakthrough. You might see this when you watch a game. You know, you're down. There's, I don't know, two minutes left. Your team gets the ball. Let's talk, we're talking football here. You're down by six points. You get the ball, two minutes left. They make the drive, they make the drive. And you get down there and you throw the touchdown and now it's tied up. And you kick the field goal with 14 seconds left. Everybody's chest bumping, high-fiving. Oh, yes. But you still have to kick the ball. And the other team runs it back. You see this, this happen. Breakthrough is temporary. And yet so many times we put our hope in a breakthrough. Just like we ha have our hope break because of a trial. Can I tell you that's not hope? We're talking this morning about hope or misplaced hope. There's a, a message that was to bring for you, to you and me joy. And we're going to look at that this morning. I want you to see this, that oftentimes God tells us things that we just don't see. Could, could, could that be? You know what I'm saying? Like, like um, maybe you try to, like my wife, sometimes you just don't understand fully what they're trying to say. Like my wife told me the other day, she said, I would like nothing more uh, than than a diamond necklace for Christmas, so I got her nothing. <laughs> I would like nothing more than, right? So I heard what she said, but I didn't, she doesn't want a diamond necklace. She, no, truly, she really never said that. But, but sometimes we hear, I want nothing more than this, and so then we get them, like we didn't see what was actually said. We didn't see what was actually said. And, and the Jews, they didn't see what was actually said a lot of times when the Lord was prophesying and declaring about a coming king, a coming savior. And the reason he would have to come as a form of a ba in the form of a baby and a man was to pay a price. So all the while, God was working together for good. God was working together for good in a baby but we didn't see it. We wanted a king. But all the while, God was working together. All the while, God was working. But we're looking for a king, and we're missing the very thing the very, that God's working. That God's working. That God's working. You know, sometimes when I see lack in my life, I, God's working in me, this position of my heart, of where my trust lies. Oh, God's working in me, Father. When, I, when, I, when, I, when, when a sickness comes up on my body, I, I get to position myself and my heart and work and to position my heart on where my health and my healing comes from. Oh, instead of focusing and, under, and looking at all of like what's not, what's well, God is working all the while together for, together for good. 
in my life right now. God's working in my body. He's working in my finances. He's working in my children. Father, thank you. And there's a positioning of trust. You know, see, trust, ha- trust is something interesting because it, it doesn't, you, you have to trust because you can't see it. And, and, and not only trust, but have you ever been, wor- been w- with somebody? This is, <laughs> no, I'm not going to bring that up. I, I, my wife had a baby. Well, we had three babies. But the last one, I guess I'm bringing it up now. But the last time we had the baby, um, I got to deliver it, whatever, and um, I was really into just like, I would love to be a doctor or put people back together, you know, like sew things up, sew thumbs up, you know, like whatever it might be. I love working. It doesn't gross me out. It just doesn't, all right? Blood doesn't mess with me. Um, and so well, after the baby or whatever, and, and the doctor was having to do a little bit of stitching, and I'm like, oh, hey, you need to... Uh, you, hey, uh, I was trying to tell the doctor what to do because, and he said, he said this, he said, just trust me, but I, I okay, all right, oh, hey, good job, <laughs> I guess you might have known a little bit more, and I use that analogy as a doctor because the doctor went to school, all I can see is what was uh, what was on the on the surface? So he was he was working and doing more work than what I understood. Yeah. Yeah. Can I tell you that God works that way? He's 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 not he he is the he has a whole lot more knowledge than some twenty six year old kid that's in there going ah uh, uh, okay, okay I'll trust you. We got to trust the Lord. So I want you to see this a few different scriptures. Um, uh, <clears throat> they were told. Um, They were told about a savior, but could only picture a king, not a baby. Sometimes we can only picture a certain way. And because we can only picture a certain way, we can often be disappointed. Um, uh, There's a scripture, I can't remember the verse, Mona will will give it to me, uh, because this is one of her favorite scriptures. I would have despaired had I not believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Right? Right? What's that? Help me out. Psalm 27. So I would have despaired if I... But can I ask you this? What does the goodness of God look like? And has it already been sent to us? Or am I still looking for it? We're going to talk this morning about, um, about having a hope that's a future. And that that is truly the anchor for our souls. Um... But, but somehow, especially I would say, I would just say as Christians, and, uh, and, and you could call it, um, I'm not going to put a blanket on any of that. But somehow, say this, somehow, eternity in heaven has become the consolation prize instead of the big prize. Have you ever been to a fair? Anybody? Anybody like going to the, where they play the, the games, you know, you throw the ball in the bucket or you throw the ball and you try to knock the milk bottles off the table and, or you shoot the star out? Hey, come on. Any, any dad spent too much money? Any boyfriends in here spent too much money? Okay, y'all, y'all don't, you're not going to get this in. So here's what you do. When you go to the fair, you go to this place they call like the Midway or where all the carny uh, bull games are. Or, or, or carnies, you know, like, I don't know why we called them that. When growing up, it's like, oh, they're uh, the, all the carnival games. Anyway, so we go down there, and they always have those big stuffed animals, right? Like the big teddy bear, right? And you, as a kid, you always want the big prize. Or I remember, um, you know, you shoot, the, you shoot the basket, right? You shoot the basket on an oval-shaped rim that's way further than it looks, and it's all these optical illusions, and if you make it, you know... Uh, but if you're like, yeah, you get the basketball. But if you make it one more, you can have that thing hanging up right there. You know, they put it up real high because they never have to get it down. It's not just so everybody can see it. But, but there is, I don't know if you've ever played a game where I remember they would give us these bananas. And if you could trade up, but you needed seven bananas to win the big prize. So you had to pay so much just to play to get these bananas, and you had to win to get the... But if, if you played, you got to win this banana. So after seven tries, you could for sure get to this level. Have you ever been there? I think that that's how heaven is 
a lot of and 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 salvation is and and the hope of future glory is to many Christians. Because the big prize right now is what's going on right now. I need this right now. What's going on? Well, the, my big prize right now is I need more money right now. That's the big prize. The big prize right now is I need healing right now. The big prize right now is I need I, I need uh, my ba- I need a baby right now. The big prize right now is I need this job right now. And the big prize is all these things. All these things. Instead of something that would hold us and put, keep us positioned to where our faith and our, 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 our trust in the Lord would actually work. Instead, we'd be du- instead we're double-minded because of what we see and then what we don't see. And then what we see and then what we don't see. So let me just say this through. Breakthrough, disappointment. Holiday, January. Vacation, uh, not enough to go on vacation. Somebody else's vacation. My Branson trip. My didn't go to Branson trip. Would have liked to go to Branson trip. Then you see, oh, somebody gives you something. Oh, but it's like the lows, it's, it's just interesting. It's like our highs aren't as high as they're supposed to be because they, they never can fulfill what is truly high. And so, but and then our low, and then our high doesn't quite, it's kind of like those balls, click, 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 click. And so we think that it's just going to last forever. Can I tell you, when you do that, it doesn't last forever. Eventually, and there's just this ever less where you're not able to quite get up as high as you once were. And you're not able to get up as high as once you once were. And so we're looking for things to replace or something that could get us up to that high because we've moved the highest high. To a pretty low low. And and I can say that for myself. I've seen that in my life before. Where the hope of heaven. Can I tell you I've seen that as a young boy. When I was hoping I just wanted to get married before I go to heaven. You know. Get married and have kids. Start a life. Just Jesus don't come back before then. (laughs) <laughs> let's look at here Genesis 3.15 looking uh, for a savior God sent a baby but I was looking for a king so when I'm looking for a savior what do I look for? do I look for a king? do I look for a baby? I, I don't know here's where I have to look to, and here's what I need to do I just need to trust the Lord and that he knows best this is I think we gotta we gotta go put our trust back and our hope back in the Lord. Those who trust in the Lord, well, there, there's a strength that's renewed. Isaiah tells us about those who wait upon the Lord, those who trust in the Lord. You know how many of you know wait? It talks about waiting uh, and having. If you, you if you hope, you can wait. So when you anyway, let's keep going here. Um, so Genesis three fifteen, it says that there's an offspring. That, that, that there would be an offspring sent of a woman. Um, if you don't have it, I don't either. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't write these ones down. But Genesis 3.15, ultimately it talks about a, a, a baby is going to bruise, an offspring is going to bruise Satan. Or, you know, in other words, that, that's this passage here in Genesis 3, just uh, without quoting it verbatim. It's that, that there's going to be a baby, that you're a son, a, a child is going to crush Satan. Wow. So he's telling a people about a baby, but we missed it. Can, can I tell you sometimes we hear the word and we miss the whole word? Uh, Isaiah 7 verse 14 talks about a, a virgin birth. Again, it's the foretelling of what? What is it foretelling? A virgin birth. There's going to be a, a savior who is a baby, right? Right? There's this, there, and we could go through verse after verse after verse about the telling of a child that's going to come, about a telling not only of a child, but of a king who's going to 
suffer, not just kind of conquer, but who's going to suffer and is going to pay a price, who's going to be beaten, who's going to be. But we don't see those things. We only see king, rule, reign, win. I'm his family. That means I'm probably going to be in the palace too, and we're going to tell you what to do. We have these ideas, and we miss the very thing that God was saying. Micah 5.8, Bethlehem will be his birthplace. So he'll be born in Bethlehem. So there's these prophecies that are telling, that the word is telling of, about how a Savior is going to come and what the Savior is going to look like. And it's not going to look like what you thought it would look like. Can I tell you, sometimes we mess ourselves up. And we hoped it would have been this way, but because we hoped it had been this way and we had misplaced hope, we got hurt. And so then here's what happens is we hope less. We're not just hopeless, we're hopeless. And we don't want to get our hopes up. And so well, let me say this, when I don't want to get my hopes up, here's what I, I find is I find I, I trust less. When I hope less, I trust less. I trust what? I hear uh, we'll, we'll wait and see. Okay, because that's really working. Wait and see. We'll wait and see what? For a breakthrough? Or, or a disappointment, a trial? Let's keep going here. So, uh, <laughs> many, many of the Jews missed salvation, though it was sent to them. You ever think about that? It was sent to them. They just didn't recognize it. It was a baby. They would only recognize it if they partnered uh, it through faith. You remember there was one that recognized before it was disclosed and it was revealed to him not by what he saw, but by the Father in heaven. Peter, he said, who do you say that I am to all the disciples? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And he said, blessed are you because what you got, you didn't get with flesh and blood. You didn't get with what your eyes could ascertain or what somebody else told you. You got with what you received from the Father. Can I tell you that this is an, where our anchor is to hold, where we have an anchor that's for our souls? Can I tell you, if that, the hope that you have is not anchored and held to you, it, it does, an anchor does no good unless it's attached to the boat. You tie that on? Shoot. It's happened before. It's happened. I've been a part of it. You've got to keep it in your hand, Philip. You've got to keep... <laughs> I've been on the boat with him, and, and he, he's, we're fishing, and he casts the whole rod in the water. <laughs> Son of a gun, you gotta, gotta hold on to that and then reel. And I dove in after it. Then the next time we were on this lake, and there was really big fish with teeth, and he said, Are right, you gonna go in after it? And I said, Not near, anyway. And then they end up catching it later. But yeah, it was just, you gotta, you, if it's not tied to you, it does you no good. That rod could have caught the biggest fish. But it didn't catch, we didn't catch it because it wasn't hung to, it wasn't tied to us. The anchor has to be tied to you. Hope has to be tied to you, not to just some circumstance. Not just to a location, a high, a low. We're going to anchor on this hump where the fish are holding to. That's great. But is it tied to the boat? Is it tied to you? Where, where's the hope anchored? All right, let's keep reading here. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Uh, I'll give you this. So, m m anyway, why is it important um, to have a hope that's not just, uh, just why is hope so important and, and, and a future hope, which we're, we're going to talk about, because hope for tomorrow gives me strength for today. Because hope for tomorrow gives me strength for today. Or let's say it this way. Hope for the future gives me strength in the now. Can I, can, let's look at sports again. You can see this all the time. When a team knows they lost or they're down real big, do they have much strength? No. I mean, you can have a team that the next time they, they want to just start over and they can come back and they can beat that team another time. They can't beat them that time. Why? Because they have no hope. Because where there's no hope, there's no strength. And this is what, what the enemy, his, his work is, is to rob you and I of our focus, of our future hope, that, so that he can rob you and I of our strength. Because the hope of my tomorrow is what gives me strength for my today. If I think that, that like, let's just talk about jobs or, I'm going to talk about pastoring, okay? So uh, I used to be a contractor, 
Uh, and, and the Lord blessed my business, right? And that was kind of this thing where you could go work and you could get paid for what you did, okay? Um, and so you, in a sense, uh, based on your hard work, you could set your own ceiling, okay? Or you could say, well, I know if I do this, I'm going to get this, okay? Stepping into, over into pastoring, which is what I had went to school for, just ultimately just I wanted to follow the Lord, and I knew that I had a call of God in my life, all right? So I step into doing this, and this is totally different. There's no preach better, get more. Matter of fact, there's no tell the truth and more come. There's no, you know, formulate this. Matter of fact, uh, in that place where you put that you think you did it and you got all your, your trust too much in yourself and you think you just hit it out of the park that day, then uh, and like you're like, where's everybody at next week? And you just, you, well, you just realize how bad you are. And so you have this thing that, that you have called PTSD. It's like, like a PTSD, a PMS. Yeah. But they're really, like, pa pastors can struggle with, with this, this, oh, what, what happened or didn't happen, or PMS, post-message syndrome. So I'm happy or I'm sad based on how it was received or not received, and that can last weeks could last a day. It could last till you hear an encouraging word. You could last till you, you don't. And you have this 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 time of like, uh, what's gonna what's how do I do what I'm doing? I can't work it harder. I don't know how to work it harder. I I, I matter of fact, this is actually a conversation. I don't know how we got here, but we're gonna go with it. The, keep going, and then we'll jump back. I was having a conversation with Landon and. Uh, and Ben, who is on staff, runs social media stuff, and we know in our heart is to get the word out, preach Jesus. That's part of the ministry of Beyond Church, both to equip the saints for the works of the ministry and, and to preach the message of Jesus. What comes here, let it be exported. There's plenty of other junk on, on, out on the media that it would be good to have the word of God out there. So you guess what? What comes out here, what comes, and is the voices that are spoken here, we're going to get it out there, the word. Put it out there. Put it out there. Awesome. But we were talking about this upcoming series and advertising, or not, that's what it would be, advertising for this upcoming series, inviting people to church about hope. And, you know, in order to advertise on Facebook, you got to do something called sponsored. Anybody ever seen a sponsored ad? I struggle with that. I struggled with it really hard. Um, I don't want to be a salesman. And I don't see it as, now, I, and what I mean by that is I don't think it's wrong. As long as it's with, not in place of. I struggle with it because I, I believe what the Bible teaches is that, that uh, the sheep make sheep. And the, the people come into Christ, and this is where I, I actually told Landon this. I, I liked, sometimes I liked painting way better than I liked pastoring for this reason. I knew more people, and my job took me into places where I could share the message with people that haven't heard. And, I, and it's, I felt like more people came to Christ oftentimes when I could be out in the highways and byways than when I stood up here and talked to people and I'm limited to what is done through people. That you'll carry a message only if you want to. Yet I'm up here carrying a message. This is, I'm, this is real talk. So I struggle. I, I want to I, I put lots of money in that and say, come to church. But I don't want to be fake because I would, if I was right there in your living room, I'd say, hey, there's a hope for you. There's a future for you. There's a God that loves you. That I would have that. I want to take carry that. But you know, I don't want to carry that that way unless we are all carrying that. Can, can, when you come and you come and you gather with believers, are you not equipped are you not strengthened? Are you not encouraged as you meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Is his word not true? When two or more gathered, there he is. Is that not true? Because it's true for me. When I come and I've been gone and I've maybe been out and I come back together with other believers, with you, it could be anywhere, but with believers. God shows up. It doesn't matter the denomination. It doesn't matter what, where, it just, where we come to worship the Creator. He is there. And i got to carry that as that's true. And, and guess what? I need to meet with him. But I, so do so many others. Here's what I, I guess this is a move to a challenge this morning about where's the hope? Do you hold it? 
Do I hold the hope? Do I really hold the hope? Because otherwise I'm not, if I, if I do, then I will give hope. But if my hope is in some happenings, and my life looks trials, then I don't have a message. And I'm stalled, and I have no strength, and, and I have no message to give to somebody else because I'll be ashamed. But the hope is not about healing. It's not about money. It's not about, pro- like, you give this, you get this. It's not, it's, not, it's not about any of that. It's about God made a way when there was no way, and my hope is in an eternal future about what, when Jesus comes back for me. It's about tomorrow. We're going to see this in Scripture about how important tomorrow, your, your future hope, a hope that is still a little ways off, how that is the thing that keeps you and me sober-minded. We can be so drunk as Christians, like just happy and then just sad. You ever been around somebody that's drunk? They're so happy, but then something happens, then they're kicking and hitting, and you don't know what's going to happen. It's, it, everything's extreme. We got to carry a message because we carry a hope. If we don't carry a hope, we won't carry a message because we'll be ashamed to carry something that is not, we're not held to. And this is not a, 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 I'm just, this is a serious thing. It's like, I, do, do I get permission to put sponsor? Not unless we're bringing people to Christ as the congregation. Because then what could happen is we think we're doing okay. We'd be blind. Because things are good that we think we're good. When you move into houses and you eat from vineyards and, and things that you, vineyards you didn't plant, houses you didn't build, be careful not to forget the Lord your God. Sometimes things are so good, our lives are so good, that we're for, we, even when it's good, we forget. It's not just when it's bad, it's when it's good. I don't know God or I forgot about God. Highs and lows. Highs and lows. No strength. Can I tell you, um, to give it, this is probably, this is right, right here, I'm going to give this example, and, and uh, you're going to recognize this as, as true strength. You can be strong and have big muscles, and you can lift the weights, you can lift the bend of the pool table, you can move that couch and that fridge, you can be a big strong guy, but can you be rejected for Christ? That's strength. Anytime you give an invitation, you risk rejection. Every time to go love on somebody with your, maybe it's $5 that you have. Maybe it's a word that the Lord says, go love on that person. But you don't know what word. And what are you going to do? What are you going to say? What are you going to, and what you're risking, what you're putting out there is yourself. Risking rejection. You're risking rejection. Can you be rejected for Christ? That's strength. Strength. Can you give an invitation and, 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 and ask someone about their tomorrow because you hold the hope of tomorrow securely, not only you, but you're sealed. Ephesians 3.20, the Holy Spirit sealed you until the day of redemption. God's grip on me is greater than my grip on him. Oh, thank you that I'm sealed. Hey, can I tell you about one? This is powerful. How strong are you? How strong are you? We're we're actually coming into a season in January where we're going to be seeing gym memberships go up. How strong are you? These are good questions. This is maybe a heavy word because this is a heavy season in which we're in. Not the Christmas season, but in the end of days. And there is an arrival of a king that we talk about, about a baby that's going to be, that was sent to us and was born. But can I tell you, there's an arrival of a king, and he's soon in coming, and his reward is with him. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, his reward is with him. There's a soon in coming king, and he's not going to look like a baby. And his reward is with him, it says, it is reward for the works that you've done. You know, works take strength. 
And unless I hold the hope, the joy of the hope of tomorrow in my heart, I won't have strength to do those works. To carry a message. Romans chapter 10 tells us all about this. It says, how are they going to believe unless somebody tells them? I was thinking about that because some, some uh, the, 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 you know, while we're talking about this, we're kind of ha- having this argument about sponsored ads. And because of my makeup and my conviction and just uh, when I see sponsored things, it's like, hey, hey, you know, just like, it just turns me off, all right? That's just me. Maybe you. And um, <clears throat> somebody said, well, well what, if, what if they're not like you? And what if they just don't know? And, and that's an invitation to them. I'm like, yeah. That, that would be good because how are they going to know? I mean, here we are. So we're having this argument, right? Not an argument like, ah, but like, like yeah, so what do, we, what do we do? We don't go do anything until we get peace on it. That's, that's what we do. So we, we wait. Well, hurry up. Uh, we, we wait. And, and, and this is where I said, well, I, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, unless we're doing that and we're sure we're doing that continually as a house, and, and that, that's before us, this right here, preaching Jesus, everyone, everywhere, every day. Then, then I don't want to be putting out some sponsored ad uh, about, about that. Because if, if, if and when we are doing that continually, we believe that there's hope. There's hope in this house. There's meeting with the Savior. There's an expectation for God to move every time we come together. Can I tell you, if, if, that, is, if that right there is held in our heart, the invitations flow freely. It's true. And so these are questions about where, where is my strength? You know, we're going to be, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get back to this here, but we're coming into this next year, January 1st. Um, and really, I, I believe what God's wanting for us is to have this house in order, just order in the house. I've been, it's been for a, a number of uh, probably months that this just kind of this thought and, and I kept on seeing like, and it sounds so funny, um, but just, I was very, very aware of when I'd see things in order, whether it's the clock or whether things were in sequence, and it was just like, it would just be like this really, like, notice, pause, see that. And I'm like, why am I seeing that? Why, why am I seeing that? Or what are you saying here? What are you saying? It's like, I need some things in order. And um, one of the things is, is that my house would be a house of prayer. That's one of the things of order. How does, it, how does your house look? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. How does it look like for you and I to serve the Lord? What, are you, what did you ask for him today? What did, how did you ask for his help today? Or you, do we not need his help today? This is one of the simplest ways to start a conversation. Hey, I've had this happen so many times. Hey, pastor, can I talk to you just for one sec? I need your help on something. Yeah, 30 minutes later, we're still talking. But it was just, sir, can I tell you so many times where we, we, we feel obligated to talk to the Lord? Like it's got to be a do and I got to get my, like some kind of works thing or some kind of like heavy thing. Can I tell you, if you and I would approach him by just this, Lord, I need your help on. Just, just tell him what you need help with today. You know what will happen is that conversation will just continue. You, you, you'll find that it's like, oh, thank you, Lord. And you'll be going through your day. Thank you, Lord. Oh, okay, and then go over here. Because you asked him for help, and you, so you say, Lord, I'm looking to you for your direction, for your help. All of a sudden, he's leading you over here. He's leading you over here. And you're like, oh, thank you, Lord, for that. Is there anything else? Yeah, okay, over here. What? Oh, wow. And all of a sudden, this relationship with Christ, with the King of Kings, is born. Not just some religious duty. I need help today. Lord, I need help. I need your help to be a better father. To sharp, show me how to teach my kids today and be present with them. I just want out so many times. Like, help me be present and not distracted with everything. Just a little help. Let's keep going here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, let's see. Let's, let's, let's go here. He, uh, Hebrews chapter 6, 19 through 20. But when God made his promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and multiply your descendants. And so Abraham, after waiting patiently, obtained the promise. 
Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and their oath serves as a confirmation to end all arguments. So when God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose clear to the heirs of the promise, he guaranteed it with an oath. Thus, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be strongly encouraged. That, you know what it means to, to flip? You fled to take hold of the hope. It means you leave everything else to grab the hope. We, we leave everything else to grab to the hope. What hope? These two things. That God said and he had an oath. It's the word of God and the fact that he made an oath. Why did he do an oath? Because that's what man did. That's what man did. Man understood that if you make an oath, you cannot lie. So he said, I cannot lie. I gave you my word. But to prove to you, I also will come down and I'll pass between. Go ahead and, Abram, go ahead and make, a, make these sacrifices. Split them down the middle. And he, here he come. And, and, and the Bible says a light, like the light of God came through while, Ab, while Abraham slept or fell into a sleep. He cut a, he cut a covenant, or an oath, made an oath, and he gave his word. And he said that, 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 that is this, thus by these two uh, things, which is impossible for God to lie, we have fled to take hold of the hope set before us, may strongly be encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, it enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where Jesus, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Hope for you and me, anchored to what? The word of God, anchored not just to the word of God, but to Christ. That which went in, what went in behind the veil. He went in one time. He went in. My, your and my hope is not anchored in just promises. It's anchored in the one. It's anchored in the one Christ. Let's keep looking here as we as we work our way through this. So, First um, Peter chapter th- one, verse three through nine. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope. Did you know you can live with hope? This is what God's best would be for you and me, is that we can live with hope, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and reserved where? Somebody read it. Where is it reserved? Kept in. There is a, a, there's a treasure. That, let me tell you this. It's not the banana. It's not the, it's not the, it, that's the consolation prize. There is something that is to be, we're to be living with the hope about what Christ has done and has prepared for us in heaven. I'm not saying to negate these promises here and now, but I am saying this is way bigger I'm saying this is way bigger. And unless you know and you have trust in a future that's sure and, and, and the work of Christ, his work and his work through Christ and how he came and sent his son Jesus to pay a price we couldn't so that we could have salvation. If we don't have this view and this mindset of tomorrow and eternity and have our anchor in something that's rock solid, then guess what? We got nothing. We got a little banana. The big prize, can I tell you, it truly is heaven. Oh, well, I guess guess all you get is heaven. Well, here, roll the dice. Well, uh, well, you know, I guess guess all you get is heaven, Austin. Uh, uh. Oh, look, you got a breakthrough. $100 bill for you, Colton. Woo! $100, look. I won this. Hey, you can roll the dice. Go ahead, Kylie. You get to roll the dice. Oh, oh, just heaven. What are you gonna get? Heaven? Oh, just heaven. I mean, it's not even a very good chance. Probably just gonna get heaven. I'm telling you, this is how we've let the promise of where Jesus and our hearts are troubled. Because we're not believing in a tomorrow. Look at, um, I, I, let me, we'll jump back here in just a second. But let's, let's go to John chapter 14. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. Will you believe in God? Believe also in me. And here's what he says. He talks about heaven. When you have a troubled heart, the answer to a troubled heart is the hope of tomorrow. So here's what Jesus, he said, don't let your heart be troubled. And he starts to talk about tomorrow. 
about the hope of tomorrow, about what? In my Father's house there are many mansions. Believe in God, believe. in my Father's house there are many rooms, or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you uh, would have told you that. But instead, I'm going. Guys, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And guess what? I'm going to come back for you. Guess what? He's coming back. He's coming back. Whew. He's coming back. Can I tell you? Every tear from every eye. Can I tell you? No sickness. Can I tell you? Can I tell you what heaven is just a, just a blink of an eye and this life is just but a vapor? So why are we holding everything here up here when we should be holding this up here, can I tell you the strength of my today is found in my hope for tomorrow? We got to hold the hope of tomorrow as, a, as the great, not the grand prize. This is what Jesus, don't let your heart be troubled. How do you not let your heart be troubled? Hope for tomorrow. Because when, my, when, my, when I have hope for tomorrow, I have strength to face the trouble today. I got to have strength to face the trouble today. He tells us in Matthew 6, he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has its enough troubles. Guess what? That means there's going to be troubles tomorrow. But guess what? Your hope, your hope of tomorrow produces strength for each day. The hope for tomorrow produces strength for each day. This is, uh, let's keep going back to 1 Peter chapter uh, 1. And um, let's go to verse 4. And in, into an inheritance that's imperishable. So, he gave the resurrection of Christ and the fact that, again, if he wouldn't have raised from the dead on Easter, you know, that's why we celebrate Easter. If he wouldn't have raised from the dead, we'd have nothing to celebrate. But because he rose and proved that who he was, defeated death, and not only defeated death, but left us an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, reserved in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power for salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Excuse me. Verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. Though now, in, in what do you greatly rejoice? About the tomorrow. About the future. Are we rejoicing about tomorrow? Like, have we done a heaven dance lately? As the church, have we done a heaven dance lately? Are you going to heaven? Like, when has been our heaven dance? That I was redeemed. I was set free. I had this, but God took me and put me here. Like, when was the last time I just said, glory to God? Instead of going, well, I don't know how we're going to do that. And I don't know about that. And I guess we can't do that. I'm just not sure about that. What are you sure about? The one who holds your future? In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have suffered grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more precious than gold, which perishes even through, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, you can rejoice even though you're going through a trial. Right now. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an inexpressible and glorious joy. And now that you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The goal of your faith is not a new house. It somehow became. It's not a new, not a new house or a car. The goal of your faith is not something. It is the salvation of your souls. Verse 13, therefore prepare your mind for action. What does that mean? Be ready to go to work. Not just a church, a people of God that's just trying to make it through. But ready for work. Ready to do the Lord's work. Prepared for action. Why? Because you're filled with hope. He says, therefore prepare your minds for action. Here's how. Be sober-minded. Be sober-minded so you can... Because there's, there's nothing worse than starting something and then coming back and not figure, knowing how to pick up where you left off. And then it's like you come back and then you're like, oh. And then you come back. I'm, I'm actually building a house right now. It kind of has felt like that. It's like this delayed, long process of just like I'm being patient with. But like, it's like, come on. Come on. You know? 
And uh, anyway, and so you, you look at that and he says, uh, but he said, prepare your minds for action, sober minded, not here and there, not, not just like what's going to happen, but be sober minded. Here's how you're sober minded to where you can go like this, stay at it and stay at it and stay at it. And then the thing that God called you to and the, the gifts and the graces he put in your life, you can take them and you can apply them and you can steward them well for his glory, all the while carrying with it also the message of Christ. Like all of these things, all to the glory of God, you're able to set a, a, a mark before you and you can get up each day and you can get up and you can go to work for the glory of God. And you can have strength instead of weakness and tiredness. And you can now express the, and put hands and legs and work and sweat and strength to the vision and the dreams that God has placed in your heart. Why? Because you have some strength. Why? Because you're sober-minded. You can see about what? Sober-minded. Here's how you keep a sober mind right here. You set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This right here is how you have strength and, and just able to just face no matter what's going on, just un, unmoved, un, <laughs> un, and you know, everybody, everybody deals, well, I've not been drunk, right? But everybody, some people are angry drunk. Some people are pretty stinking hilarious drunk. Everybody has a different, but, but, but they're, they're not themselves, they're not themselves. And, they, and you know what they, can't, they struggle to do? Every one of them, they struggle to drive. Every one of them struggles to drive. In other words, get to the destination that they so want to get to. Can I tell you the way that you get, in, in a sense, and you go after and, and you can look at each day and go, wow, God, wow, God, look how good you've been. You can give him glory in every circumstance. Why? Because your hope is set in the Revel it says right here, so be sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. First Peter 1 24 through 25. All flesh is like grass, and the glory like flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Second mm. Corinthians 4 13 through 16, and in verse 18. Thank you, Lord. And in keeping with what is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. We who have the same spirit of faith also believe and therefore speak, knowing that the one who raised Jesus, the Lord Jesus, will also raise up, raise us up with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. This is what we know. That the one who raised Jesus will raise us. We believe and therefore we've spoken. This is so this is so important about keeping hope before you, is speaking about you getting raised up. You know why you lose excitement about what's coming? Because you stop talking about it. It's talking about what? Heaven. Talking about Jesus' return. The Bible says that we, we talk about this because it's the hope that purifies us even as we're pure. It, what does it mean to be pure? It just means all the extra things are just falling off. Pure. Holy, set apart, ready. Because so, and he goes on and says, all this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is extending to so that, so that the grace that is extending to more and more people may overflow in thanksgiving to the glory of God. Therefore, verse eight, verse sixteen, we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. How do you not lose heart when you have on your mouth about tomorrow? This is how you don't lose heart. We looked at it also in John chapter 14. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. Let me talk to you about some mansions. Let me talk to you about some houses, and let me talk to you and remind you about me coming again. Are you losing heart? Are you tired of school right now? Are you tired of going to school? Are you tired of what's happening? Are you tired of this new season of college? Don't lose heart. How do you not lose heart? Remember who called you. Remember who found you. Remember he has a plan for you. And talk about eternity this is how you don't lose heart Re be reminded of eternal things not temporary things you be reminded jesus said let me remind you of something that's eternal hey i'm going to don't let your heart be troubled i'm going to prepare a place for you i'm going to talk to you about some mansions some heaven stuff and all this kind of stuff but i'm also going to remind you i'm coming back for you i'm coming back for you 
That's something that just I'm coming. He didn't send somebody else. And that, that's, pretty, that's pretty special. Have you ever been there, like where you could have just sent somebody else to the airport to pick you up? And you were hoping somebody else, but they sent somebody else. So their helper came. And you like their helper, that's great. But it would be even cooler if they picked you up. You know what I'm saying? Jesus came, and he's coming back again. Again, we're talking about the arrival of a king. So, verse 18, again, uh, of 2 Corinthians 4, 18. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We lose heart when our eyes are nearsighted. That's how we lose heart. Matthew 6, 16 through 17. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. You're blessed. How are you blessed? When you don't look to the flesh and blood, but you look to the Father. This is how you can be blessed. You can hold hope here and now. So what future are you rehearsing? See, the, the, the reason uh, that, that, that there's such strength in the things that happen now and the things the temporary thing, is because they are speaking to you about your tomorrow. So if, if you don't have enough today, why is that so heavy? Because what you hear is, I won't have enough tomorrow either. Yeah. If, you are, if you are battling sickness today, why is that so strong? Because it's telling you you're going to be sick tomorrow. When your kids mess up and do something stupid or, I don't know, maybe they're walking away from the Lord. Maybe your kids aren't, they're not in church today. Why is that so heavy on you? Because it's telling you, tomorrow? Don't let a temporary thing that changes tell you about tomorrow. Let the King of Kings, and whose word remains forever, tell you about your tomorrow. And talk about your tomorrow. And talk about his word. Put your, his word in your mouth. Let, let, don't, look, don't look at what flesh and blood are telling you. Instead, listen, but what do you say? Oh, I see this. I see this. I know they say this. I know they say that. I know the doctors say this. I know that the, the, you know, the economics say this. I know that they say this. But what, but what do you say? Blessed are you when you look to not what these eyes see, but Lord, what do you say? You know what he had to do? Because it says it's fa the Father in heaven. The Father. Lord, what do you say? Father, what do you say? Father, what do you say? And, and why can you ask the Father? Because of Jesus. You can ask the Father because of Jesus. No matter what the circumstance would be. And you can walk in the blessing. If you'll partner with God's word. An eternal word. A hope of tomorrow. That's the hope. So what are you rehearsing? What future are you rehearsing? That's what I wanted to close with. What, what, what's your future hold? Is it uncertain? Or is it certain? What are you rehearsing? What job are you rehearsing? What are you rehearsing? What source? Where's your strength and your help come from? It comes from the Lord. What are you rehearsing today? Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you for your words spoken to hearts right now. Just bow our heads, close our eyes. Just ask the Father. But what do you say? As a child of God, if you are born again, the Bible says that you know his voice, the strangers you don't follow. Just ask him, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? So we fix our eyes today upon your word, Lord, upon the promise of tomorrow, upon the hope and the strength and the joy of, of heaven. I thank you for a new celebration, a new dance, a new song of heaven. It's not 
It's not far off. The arrival of a king. He's coming quickly. And his reward is with him. Will I find faith? Will I find faith when I return? Will I find faith when I come? You will hear. So we look to your word today. We trust you. And where our hope has been misplaced, Lord, we put it upon you. Thank you for the reality of heaven being planted in our hearts today. The hope of heaven. The weightiness of the message we carry as an eternal message. That in just a moment, we're going to blink and this season will be over. This season. Help us to steward well, to be sober-minded and choose what matters most. Because you're coming soon. Thank you for hope and joy because of the promise of a Savior being born to us in Jesus the Lord. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you don't know where you'd spend eternity if your life was required of you. And you're here. Maybe somebody brought you. Maybe you need to get your life right you know, with the Lord. With your head bowed, eyes closed, I want you to lift your hand if you need to give your life to Jesus today. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. If that's you, just lift your hand if you got to give your, give your life to Jesus today. You don't know where you spend eternity. You never made the decision to follow Christ. You never made the decision to follow Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Maybe you're watching online, and that's you. You know, we never know when this message might find you. It might be finding you today. It might be finding you in 10 years. But if you are there and you want to ask Jesus into your heart, surrender your life to him, let me just lead you in this prayer. Just repeat this after me. Father, today, I give you my heart. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I believe that he rose again, paid the price for all my sins. Lord, I give you my life. I will serve you all my days. I look to you to direct every step in Jesus' name. If that's you, you can let somebody know below or you can let somebody let some of your friends know um, of who's Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Heaven is not a little prize. Heaven's not a little prize. We have a future hope. And that right there is producing my strength for today for his glory. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night.